So without anything, uh, I can't say anything more than welcome you both, and please welcome Dr. Van Burr. to the subject, uh, and then Michelle will talk about all the interesting stuff, and then uh, when she's finished, I'm going to come back and talk a, a little bit about policy implications and that sort of thing. Oh, I think that's perfect. Yeah, that's good. Uh, anyway, so, to get started, I'd like to start with this quote because we hear it so often. Since it was used for the first time in the 1940s, Hydraulic fracturing of a natural gas well has never been proven to contaminate drinking water. Okay. What I'd like to ask the question, two questions, is this true? And secondly, does it really matter? Okay. All right. So is this true? Well, what does this mean when they say that? What it means, as I understand it, is that in the moment that a well is fractured, during that, time, during that moment, does that fracture connect with an aquifer and contaminate drinking water? Well, I think there's some, some pretty good proof now that water has been contaminated by hydraulic fracturing. But what I, what, what's more importantly, more important about that is what, what I want to show you, or what we want to show you, is that it's not just that that's important. There are a lot of other things that are important. What I want to do before I get into that is to talk a little bit about your area here. Okay? Where we are uh, in Ithaca, New York, we have both the Marcellus Shale underneath us as well as the Utica Shale. Uh, the Marcellus is about the same as the Utica here. So here you don't really have the Marcellus, you have mainly the Utica Shale. And so the Utica Shale, or both the Marcellus and the Utica Shale are named after the towns where they appear at the surface. So uh, Utica's not that far from here, right? <laughs> so, but what's really interesting about it is that it dives very deeply, or very steeply, from Utica down to here. And it goes down to about 2,000, 2,500 feet under us right here. But what's more important, I guess, about it is that it's very thick here. It's about 300 feet thick. In contrast, where we live, it's about 6,000 feet down, but it's only about 25 feet thick. So, because of that, you're in the fairway. That's the part of the, the area that the drillers like for the Utica Shale, but of course not the Marcellus Shale. So you have a real possibility of having drilling occurring into the Utica Shale. What I'd like to show you is this graph here. This comes from a paper by the industry, Data Confirm Safety of Well Fracturing. Okay? And what it shows is all that red line there is how deep the well was. And that blue line above it and below it shows where the fractures go, how far the fractures go up or go down, okay? And so look, we can look out here, and you see it's around 8,000 feet, and then there's a fracture that goes up to about 6,000 feet, right? And that's way below that blue stuff at the top, that's the aquifer. Okay. Now what I want you to think about is the Utica Shale under our feet. What we have to do to think about this graph in terms of the Utica Shale is to move it up where it says 2,000 there. So this is the, that y-axis there is the depth. So move this graph all the way up to 2,000, the red line up to 2,000, and look where those, how high those fractures can go. 
then you go right up into your aquifer. Now, it's probably true that at shallower depths, they use less pressure, so it may not be quite as bad as I say, but you have a real possibility in this area, as shallow as the shale is, to have a connection between hydraulic fracturing and your aquifer. And what's in that fracturing fluid is, they, they tell you it's just water and sand, but it has a lot of other stuff in it that's fairly nasty. And Michelle will tell you what kind of effects it can have on cows when they drink it. Okay, but that's not the only problem you have when you think about this process. What you really have to think about is the life cycle, the entire life cycle of the well. And that's why I say, does it really matter if hydraulic fracturing has never been shown to contaminate a well? Well, it may never have contaminated a well by those fractures in, say, Pennsylvania, where the shale is very deep. But there are a lot of other things about this process that can contaminate your water and your air. Drilling. Well, what happens when they drill a well is they start at the surface and they drill down and they go through your aquifer. They use drilling muds that have hydrocarbons and a lot of other fairly nasty stuff in it. So while they're going down, they're going to contact your aquifer. After they drill the well, they put this, this steel casing down and then they cement that. Okay? And they tell us that, well, now it's cemented you know, and the path down to the bottom of the well is separated from your aquifer because you have the steel and cement, maybe six layers of that. Well, <clears throat> as it turns out, that cement rarely seals it off, and there are many pathways for at least methane to find its way into your aquifer. Okay, that's just the drilling process. Hydraulic fracturing, we already talked about that. Uh, it could certainly in this area potentially contaminate the water. We also know a lot of cases where fracturing has gone bad, where they've tried to fracture the well, they've blown out the casing and contaminated aquifers. Trucking. Um, this process, as you know, requires many, many truck traffic trips to the well when the hydraulic fracturing is occurring and away from the well to take the wastewater away. And so one of the biggest problems that we'll talk about is what do we do with the wastewater? Well, the truck can get away from the well, and those trucks have accidents, and in more cases than I, you know, we can talk about tonight, people have seen valves open as they drive just to decrease the amount of fluid so it's cheaper to, uh, to dispose of. So they just let it run out of the road. Okay, then you have impoundment ponds. Um, a little darker, but this that little uh, pond out in front of that nice farm back there is a big uh, pond full of wastewater, full of benzene, arsenic, and a lot of sort of nasty chemicals. This can leak. They put misters in there to decrease the volume. They release some of the volatile organics into the air. Condensate tanks. These are tanks that are at the wellhead that separate the wet gas from the dry gas. They're always venting out hydrocarbons, and sometimes they've been known to blow out. Pipelines in drilling areas crisscross the landscape. If you're in an area of Pennsylvania that's, that's uh, drilled extensively, everywhere you look there are pipelines. These pipelines leak, and they're a source of, 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 of greenhouse gases escaping into the atmosphere. And probably the most important thing is the final thing. And that is, what happens to these wells? Well, over time, they fail. The industry tells us that at least in, in offshore wells, 50% of them fail within 15 years. The data is not really there for, the, for our area, area yet. Except that the curve that's been generated so far, the number of wells that have failed as a function of time is very early on. It looks like they're failing at the same rate as they do in offshore. 
So probably over 15 years, we're going to see half the wells fail, and longer term, they're all going to fail. Well, what do I mean by failing? What that means is the cement casing breaks down, and whatever's down there below the ground can come, come up and contact your aquifer. So the point I'm trying to make is that when we say, when you hear people say, hydraulic fracturing has never contaminated your drinking water, they're talking about one little tiny thing, just the hydraulic fracture, and they're only talking about deep wells. They're not talking about the geology here. And they're not talking about the entire process. Michelle. Okay, so people often ask us um, why we started doing this work documenting these problems with animals. And my answer to that is, we wanted to find out not only what was um, happening with the animals, but also what might happen to us. Um, because of higher rates of breeding and shorter generation times, we will see health problems sooner and more intensely. Okay, so um, look at the center of this uh, chart first. And what we did was we documented cases involving owners and their animals. The animals fell into three categories. It was um, food animals, which were mostly beef cattle, but also some dairy cattle, goats, and chickens. And um, companion animals, mostly cats and dogs, but also horses and goats. And then the wildlife uh, were many different species. Um, but mostly it was fish and uh, deer. Um, around the outside of this um, circle uh, are the potential sources of exposure that we're aware of. This uh, by no means is complete. Whenever we get a new case, uh, sometimes we find out about, uh, about a new source of exposure. Uh, Robert has already talked about some of these things, and I'm going to go through them now in uh, individual categories and, and talk about some cases that uh, we've seen. So um, whenever we do documentation, I always ask people, uh, you know, when did your well, when did your water change? If so, what did it, how did it change? And people will oftentimes tell me uh, the dates when drilling was done and when fracking was done, and uh, sometimes the water quality will change with when the drilling and fracking occurred. Um, they'll say that the appearance of their water changed, the color changed, they'll talk about the smell of the water changing, um, as well as the taste. And oftentimes they'll mention to me that way before the water actually changed, um, their animals just stopped drinking it. And to me, what that says is probably the smell had already started to change and animals' sense of smell is so, so good, so much better than ours, that they sensed it and they stopped drinking it. Um, drilling fluids uh, uh, or muds uh, are also kept in a pit uh, on the pad and those pits uh, have liners and they can leak and sometimes they can spill. Uh, the drilling fluids can also overrun the well patch or blowout. We actually had a case of that. Uh, and these are, this is the actual herd that was involved. Um, and so what happened there was uh, the muds ran off of the pad, ran into the pasture and into the pond where this herd was grazing. Um, and uh, what happened with the first calving season post drilling was the farmer lost 10 of 18 calves. Uh, those, of those 10, uh, they were either born dead or dead within 24 hours. Five of those calves had congenital abnormalities, cleft palate, or eye uh, changes. The second calving season, post-drilling, five of the 19 failed to breed, uh, but those that did produce normal calves. The third calving season, he had absolutely no calves, despite normal behavior on the part of the cows and the bull. So uh, what I found is with most of these guys, these farmers, especially beef cattle farmers, I think, you know, dairy cattle farmers too. Most of the dairy guys have AI. Beef cattle farmers, um, what they do is instead of spending the money to work up that bull right there, and that was a great bull compared, uh, um, according to the farmer, was that they will just replace the bull. And they'll see what happens the next season. So now we're into the fourth season, and what the farmer tells me is that so far all of his cows are bred, and he's keeping his fingers crossed that maybe he's going to get some calves. Um, but what this says to me is that, um, and he's not the only one I'm following longitudinally, we're able to look at the herds over time. What it says to me is that these are effects that don't go away anytime soon. He took his cows off that pasture and away from that pond uh, 
uh, about three or four months after that happened, he was told by the DEP that there would be no problem, that that would be safe, that there was no problem with that wastewater, there was nothing in the wastewater that could harm his cows. He, uh, he believed them and he allowed his cows to stay on. He started seeing problems, uh, reproductive problems. He, he pulled his cows completely away from that. But he still continued to have problems, so just keep that in mind. Okay, so um, I'm going to get back to this slide, I can't go through each one. The drilling fluids, uh, again, can overrun the well pad. We talked about that one uh, during blowout. Um, storm water runoff, uh, during a storm, uh, can have runoff from the well pad, chemicals can come off the pad, and flaring and venting are also sources of uh, air contaminants. In fact, in some parts of the country, uh, all depending on what's, uh, what's happening, how many wells are around them, people will often describe the air quality as being much worse than their water, water quality. Um, and what I'm hearing from people is that, you know, I can be on a water buffalo and bottled water, but what about my air? I, I can't, but I've got to move away, or how can I get away from the air? They're not supplying me with air. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is um, the fracking. That's an actual a picture of a fracking uh, taking place. Um, again, a well water quality and quantity can change. Um, Fraction fluid can be released from holding tanks, and that occurred in two of our cases that we documented. And one of them is uh, very well known. Uh, this one happened in Louisiana in April 2009, and 17 cows actually died in one hour following exposure to fracturing fluid. Um, and uh, there's the symptoms up there. Uh, mostly, uh, I talked to the pathologist on this case. Mostly it was a lot of... Uh, Respiratory signs, a lot of pleural edema because of the uh, aspiration. They will actually aspirate their, their vomit when they regurgitate. Um, and the cause of death was respiratory failure with circulatory collapse. Now, petroleum hydrocarbons were found in the small intestine, but they also found lesions in the trachea, lung, liver, and kidneys that indicated some sort of toxin. So it was not a straightforward case. Usually with cow deaths, when they're exposed to uh, petroleum hydrocarbons, it takes them like one to three days to die. If they're going to die, it's usually within that time. But in this case, it was one hour. Um, these cows, according uh, to the veterinarian I spoke with, were absolutely in great health before this happened. In an hour, they were dead. Uh, again, uh, I put quaternary ammonium compounds and a question mark on there because Quaternary ammonium compounds can be highly toxic and they were found in the frac fluid. However, they were not found in the tissue of the, of the cows. I don't know if they looked for them or not. They found lesions that could, they could have been caused by that, but they weren't exactly found there. So when people say to us, do you have definitive proof of any case where it's, it's shown for sure that it's caused by drilling, I have to say no. I don't. And the reason I don't is because we don't often know what's in the frac fluid. In this case, we found out what was in it, but according to what I know from necropsy reports, we don't know that these compounds were exactly found in the tissue of the cows. Yeah, we're going to try to pull the questions to the end of it. Okay, so these are pictures actually from that case. This was, uh, you can see the fracking going on in the background there. Those are the cows that just uh, dropped over on the pasture. Um, the other case of that was in um, Colorado, and that was involving goats. So that was hundreds of barrels of frac fluid leaked onto that pasture, and the goats suffered reproductive problems over the following two years. Okay, and frac fluid is overrunning the well pad during uh, a blowout. Um, that happened in Leroy Township last year, if you recall, last April. Uh, storm water can also run off the well pad, and um, well casing failures can cause uh, groundwater to be affected and to change in quality. We are documenting a case currently in Pennsylvania where um, dairy cattle um, were exposed to well water and they're, they're having uh, a lot of health problems. They keep the young stock out in pasture on a pond and they're not exposed to the well water and the young stock are not affected. So it's one of these cases, again, if you read our paper, we talk about natural controls where farmers will keep their Amount, a herd on one pasture and some of the herd on another pasture. Those, then you've got uh, an incident where this part of the herd is affected, but this part is not, and we can look at differences in health effects. 
Okay, so the next um, area is uh, wastewater. Uh, Robert talked a little bit about those wastewater impoundments. Um, they can have liners and they can leak and spill. And we have several cases um, with this sort of exposure. Um, the one is a case where the herd was actually quarantined. In fact, it's the only one we have where the herd was quarantined. And this is uh, due to the strontium that was found in the wastewater. The first calving season post-drilling, the farmer lost two calves. One of those uh, was a late-term abortion. Uh, the other calf died within seven days. Uh, both of those calves were exposed in utero to wastewater. Now, the second calving season, the farmer lost 11 out of 17 calves. Seven of those uh, were either born dead or died within 24 hours. Three of them died within a few months, and one was uh, severely ill. And on uh, those, those dams, those uh, the second calving season, the dams of all those calves were exposed to the wastewater. Okay, and this is another case of sort of what I just described before, where the farmer is keeping uh, some of his herd on one pasture and some of the herd on another pasture. So he has 140 head <clears throat> on one pasture. Uh, those cattle were exposed to wastewater uh, when the liner was allegedly slit, according to the farmers. Approximately 70 of those cattle died, and survivors had a high incidence of stillborn and stunted calves. The remainder of the herd was kept on another pasture, was not affected, uh, did not have any uh, health uh, or growth problems. Um, impoundments that are not contained, um, wildlife can get into them, small animals can get into them, uh, wastewater spread on the road. Uh, Robert, I think he's going to mention about beneficial use. Uh, if you read that long document, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about there. Our DEC refers to wastewater being spread on the road as a beneficial use. Uh, um, we don't happen to think that's the case because we have cases where uh, dogs have walked on the road, have lapped up puddles of wastewater. Um, the wastewater can go off, off the road, is usually pointed so that the water a little tipped at the middle so then the water runs off and then it can go into uh, creeks or ditches. Um, so that can be a problem. Wastewater dumped on property. We have a, a farmer, a case of a farmer who caught the drillers dumping wastewater on his crop and he lost his, uh, his crop. And these are photos of the deer that were taken on his property three to four weeks after this incident happened. And they were uh, sort of wasting a wedge. Um, and uh, we've seen pictures of, like, of this before from other people who document wildlife. Um, people have reported wastewater being dumped into creek streams, rivers, and lakes. And it can be inject injected into deep vertical wells, affecting our water quality and also possibly causing earthquakes. If any of you have been following the situation mm -hmm. in Ohio, as well as Arkansas, we have a case uh, right now. We're documenting in Arkansas where the fellow uh, is surrounded by three of these deep injection wells, <coughs> and he's right in the middle of the earthquake zone. Yeah. Um, this is another case out of Colorado, and those are, uh, it almost looks like a geyser out there, but that's a big uh, wastewater impoundment, and uh, those are misters, and Robert mentioned uh, the misters, and what they do is they try to decrease the volume in the impoundment. These things are sometimes really big. They can be up to five acres and even bigger. Um, and so the drillers want to drop the volume so they have the misters in there, uh, putting this stuff in the air, and volatile organics, a lot of it, that's the BTEX, benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene, um, that uh, causes respiratory problems, and they're carcinogens too. Um, and then the other thing that it does, though, is it makes what's left over more toxic. Um, people in Pennsylvania, the drillers are talking about reusing this wastewater so that you've got a great idea to set, say you're going to recycle, but then you're using something that's even more toxic uh, uh, than you started with. Okay, and the last thing I want to mention here is that uh, storm water can run off the impoundment. Uh, we drove around Pennsylvania was it in the fall? We took a lot of pictures and um, it was easy to see where the wastewater had run off the impoundment and down the slope. It was all white on the side and the grass in the hill was sort of burned where that happened. Uh, so if you haven't done that yet, um, I would recommend doing it. Okay, so the last, uh, last category here is the processing and production. Um, we have several cases of uh, people reporting the compressor stations malfunctioning. Usually what they say is they'll hear loud sirens and noises 
and they'll see oil uh, misting in the air and settling on their farm equipment, their ponds, uh, their crops, and they take a pictures and show those. Uh, pipelines can leak and rupture, and condensate tanks will bend. Uh, again, volatile organics and uh, chemicals that can cause respiratory and neurological signs. Um, and condensate tanks can also spill. So in Robinson Township, uh, mid-February, um, that happened. And there was an unknown amount of condensate that ran off into the creek, and um, the people around there were really concerned that their well water might become contaminated. OK, so what are the health impacts that we found? In general, we found that with food animals and with small animals, the big impact was reproduction. We found a failure to breed of both males and females. Remember, I was talking before about the bull. I've heard that now in several cases where people will say, I don't know whether it's my pals or my bull. And we'll come to find out it could be one or the other. So it affects uh, both of them, abortion, stillbirth, and failure to cycle. Um, with humans, the major signs are burning of the eyes, nose, and throat, headaches, nosebleeds and rashes, as well as gastrointestinal signs. So people will most commonly report vomiting and diarrhea and cramping. Um, and I just want to mention, uh, just today I read about a study out of um, the Colorado School of Public Health. And uh, they, uh, I didn't hear it again. Um, they just, uh, uh, it was three years, and they were studying the chemicals uh, that were being released. They were monitoring chemicals, but doing the same thing that we are doing but with, with just people. Uh, and what they found um, was that the air pollution was caused by the fracking part of the whole process. Uh, and uh, they said it was due to exposure to trimethyl benzenes, aliphatic hydrocarbons, and xylenes. And uh, all of those things can have neurological and respiratory effects. And that what they saw was eye irritation, and we saw that too, headaches, sore throat, and difficulty breathing. So again, basically what we saw, they said were the most common signs. And that, that just came out uh, in, a news, in a news report, and it should be published soon. OK, so um, for us, looking at this whole study that we did here, I think our biggest concern is with farmers and food safety. So that's what I'm going to spend the rest of the time uh, that I have talking about. Um, again, it's the big issue we feel is economics. We found that on average, 50% of the herd was affected by death and failure of survivors to breed. And um, there's a Penn State, Penn State study that just came out recently that compared this, the uh, counties in Pennsylvania with the most number, highest number of Marcellus well, well, wells to the counties with the least number or no wells. And what they found were that in the counties with the uh, most drilling, the number of dairy cows and the milk production dropped significantly compared to the counties with no drilling. Um, and we also found that farmers uh, were going out of business. In our little study here, uh, we have dairy, a, cow, a farmer who lost cows after an exposure in her, with her well water. Um, she uh, had her milk production drop by 50%, and then her survivor, surviving cows failed to breed. And at that point, she said to me, I, I didn't want to stick around and watch what was going to happen. She just went out of business. Uh, we also have two goat farmers that were so afraid that their products were not going to be safe, their milk and meat products from these goats, that they just took themselves out, out of business. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think what's important to remember here when we look at our study is that there's only one herd that was quarantined, yet all of the herds were exposed to air or water or soil contamination. Um, so two questions arise from this as far as uh, food safety goes. And these are the questions that we get most asked most often. People will call us or email us and say, you know, I don't really care about anything that you're doing except the food safety. Can you tell me if my food's going to be safe? That's all they want to know. So the first question is, uh, how safe are the meat, eggs, and dairy products from farms where known exposures have occurred and from farms downstream and downwind of those farms? And the answer is we don't know. We don't know because there's a lack of federal funding for food safety research, specifically that related to chemical contamination. So in the process of documenting um, 
uh, the case that was quarantined, which is case three in the paper, uh, I contacted the organization that set the quarantine times, and that, that's FAMRA, and that stands for Food Animal Residue of Wins and Depletions. Uh, and I asked them specific questions about hold times uh, for the cattle. Now, the hold time is the amount of time that a cattle is held back from slaughter after exposure to a chemical. And the chemical could be a, a drug, such as an antibiotic, it could be a pesticide, or it could be one of these chemicals uh, that are drilling, using drilling and fracking. And what I found is uh, that uh, uh, they basically don't know. They didn't know the answer. They said that there's a, a lack of knowledge as far as hold times for animals exposed to chemical contaminants due to drilling and fracking. Uh, and also that there's a great need for research in this area to keep public health uh, safe. So uh, what I'm going to do is read you this quote from the official, and emphasis there is, is his, not mine. This is an email of correspondence. We are told by the newly reorganized USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture that chemical contamination is not their priority. Hence, Barry is not a priority, despite pages and volumes of data and arguments to the contrary, including congressional authorization. Okay, so the second question, um, okay, so, so this is a concern to us because the food producing animals exposed to chemical contaminants have not been tested before slaughter, and also uh, because farms and areas testing positive uh, for air and or water and their soil contamination are still producing meat, dairy, and egg products without testing the food or products or the animals. So this uh, second question that comes up with food safety is, how safe is the rendered flesh uh, from cattle? And you have to remember that the rendered flesh is used to produce feed for pigs and chickens and, and our pet uh, food too. So it's, perf it's perfectly uh, likely that these contaminants that the cattle were exposed to will still work their way into our food supply. And again, without uh, complete knowledge of all the chemicals used, all the chemicals used for drilling and fracking, and complete testing, we really feel that the public health is at risk over both the short and long term. Okay. So that is my last slide. And uh, what I'd like to do is finish by uh, reading some quotes. Uh, these are quotes um, uh, from people uh, all over the country. And we kept hearing these things over and over. So I thought, when I give a presentation, I'm just going to read uh, these quotes. Um, so here they are. What are buffaloes and what are dispensers have replaced our water sources? All of my puppies were born dead. I have no calves this year. My vet can't figure out what's happening to my animals. We had to leave our home to escape the bad air. I had no choice but to leave my goats and pigs behind. We all have headaches, nosebleeds, and rashes. I'd move out, but I can't afford it. Thank you. Robert's going to take <laughs> So, what are we going to do about this? <laughs> uh, one of the things, you know, we don't have high volume hydraulic fracturing in New York. And we don't understand the human and animal health impacts. And I firmly believe that we shouldn't have it until we do. Our governor has said over and over, well, we're going to decide whether to do this based on the science. And then at the same time, he says, well, we're going to make a decision in months rather than years. Well, I can tell them, I've told a number of people in the legislature, that we don't have the scientific data to decide whether this is safe, and we're not going to have it in the next few months. So I don't think we can make a decision on this at this point. But the DEC, Department of... Uh, environmental conservation has a solution. What they tell us is that they don't have to know anything about the public health impacts because they're going to do such a great job of regulating the industry, there won't be any. But if there is, they can, they can Google, do a Google search to find out what to do. <laughs> they, they didn't exactly say it that way, but if you read the S guys, that's essentially what they're saying. Uh, I was also talking to someone recently about ag and markets. I don't know if anybody farms here, 
but ag markets are, you know, or things that are, I think the department is supposed to protect our farms. Uh, their point of view is that they don't really want to be, get involved and they trust the DEC. So they, they're, they're in charge of our, our farm products. And they say, well, the DEC is in charge of the public health impact. And the DEC says, well, there's not going to be any public health impact. So where are we? So if any of you are farmers, talk to ag and markets and tell them you want to be protected. Okay. So what else? Well, one of the problems that we find is that sometimes it's hard to get information. Um, I got called recently by a reporter from Dallas, and he said, how did you guys get this information? In Texas, the companies just pay people off and shut them up. And, and so basically what they do is they sign these things called non-disclosure agreements. So if anybody's in business, you know that you know, if you want to get a collaborator, if you want to you know, get, a, get somebody to help you, consult with you, you often have them sign a non-disclosure agreement so, that, so they don't take any of your trade secrets. Well, this is a really good business tool that everybody uses. I've signed these for pharmaceutical consulting and all that. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is that people are told that they can't talk about the contamination of their water and their health problems in exchange for money. So basically what we're doing is we're silencing people. We're silent, we're hiding public health information. Pennsylvania has taken it one step further. They've told their doctors that, well, they can find out about proprietary compounds that the drilling company uses if, it's, if they need it to treat a patient, but they have to sign a non-disclosure agreement before they do that. So if they have other people that they're treating, they have to sign multiple non-disclosure agreements, and they can't make that public. So they're, they're also silencing doctors. What we have to have here is a complete ban on non-disclosure agreements when public health is at risk. Okay. Next, next thing I want to talk about is testing. Okay. One of the problems in Pennsylvania, and in fact everywhere else in the country where this process is allowed, is that we hear about contamination and people show that they have arsenic in their water, methane in their water, etc. And the drilling companies say, well, it's always been there. Or, you know, you have 2BE in your water, you must have used Windex or something like that. You know, you, that stuff that's giving you cancer, that's because you use Windex. Okay, now what has to happen is we need to test our water before drilling starts. I'm not talking about the normal test like coliform uh, comp counts and that sort of thing. In order for us to move forward, we need to know whether our wells are contaminated before they start drilling. So if they contaminate our wells, we have we can say, look, this is what it was before, this is what it is now. But the problem is, what do we test for? Well, we don't really know. Um, the DEC has mandated pre-drilling testing, but only within a thousand feet of a well. And what's really funny about that, I, well it's not really very funny, but really unusual, is they go through a hole in their, in their uh, environmental impact statement, in the generic environmental impact statement, they say, well, one of the things we don't if, expect to find is BTEX, it's benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene. They state that in numerous places. And then you get to the part about pre-drilling testing, and they say, the only thing we're going to test for is BTEX, the stuff that they said is not going to be there. Uh, this is actually true. It's, it's not unbelievable. But I, I, actually, I do believe that it'll be there, and I do believe, actually, that's a good thing to test for. But we don't know everything to test for. Because at least the hydraulic fracturing fluids have only partially been released to us. The, the components have only partially been released to us. Um, what happens is that in industry now has a website called Frack Focus where they publish what they've used in each well, but they publish it after the fracking occurs. So you can't use that information to do pre-drilling testing. So what we have to push the DEC to do is to make sure that the drillers test, tell us what they're going to 
inject into our ground, we need to test that in advance. One more thing about that. We can't allow the drillers to do the testing. <laughs> there might be some conflicts of interest, but that's the, that's the least of it. The other thing, when they, when they do the testing, when they pay for the testing, when they take the testing to the, the water to the testing lab, they own the results. And they only reveal to you the results if they want to. Or if somehow you force them to with a lawsuit. So what we need to do is have them pay for the testing, but have it done completely independently, and you need to own your own water results. Okay. And finally, I said that the DEC mandates 1,000 feet. I guess the best science right now says we need to go out at least 3,000 feet around a well pad for testing water at least five miles per air. Okay, so what happens when we test? What do we know? How do you interpret a test? This is something that's turning out to be really interesting and really disturbing. Well, the way you interpret a test generally is something called a maximum contaminant level, or MCF. What that means is that's the highest concentration that drinking water can have of any given substance and still be safe. Okay? So if you're if they do a test and you're below the MCL, well then they say your drinking water's safe. Now what I forgot to do tonight is to bring, a, bring uh, this sample of water that we have, that you, you've all seen it, these samples of water that people hold up, they're all cloudy and dirty. Um, well, okay, so we have one of these we usually show. But uh, actually somebody that we know recently tasted <laughs> the water uh, that came from the same tap that I had there. It took him uh, most of the day to get rid of the burning in his mouth. Okay, That home, the people have lived there since 1968. They never had problems with their water until drilling started. And this is in Pennsylvania. Department of Environmental Protection tells them that their water is just fine. Despite the fact that it burns your mouth. Okay. But the, of course they won't taste, the officials won't taste the water. <laughs> okay, so what are MCLs and that's what that's they, they base this on MCLs, this maximum contaminant <coughs> level. So what are they? Well, th they come from two different places. One is that they give chemicals to rats, and they look at something like whether the rat dies, and then they extrapolate back to a safe concentration. The other way they do it, and this is what New York does mainly, is they make it up. That's all they. Do. They say, we are going to set a certain level and everything, every chemical is going to have the same level, except for the ones we tested. Okay. This doesn't make any sense, but if you look in the S guys, you can see that. Okay. But one of the most important things, and this is something that really came out beautifully in a paper that was just released this week, or at the end of last week, rather, and that is that these MCLs are based on high doses. A lot of these chem chemicals that are used affect the endocrine system and reproduction. And they can cause cancer. It turns out that with a lot of these types of substances, it's not a simple correlation between the dose and the effect. Some of these compounds will work at really low concentrations, way below the MCL. And they might even have a different effect at high concentrations. So the interpretation of these tests are really suspect. And we're learning more and more about that. And it's probably the reason why we hear over and over from, from uh, the DEP in Pennsylvania, all these people's water are just fine, but they're getting sick and getting rashes and everything. Well, the MCLs that are set are just not based on modern science, and that's the problem. Okay, let me make a few more comments. Uh, <clears throat> let me just talk a little bit about the wastewater, because that's been a real big, really big problem. Uh, and it's going to be a very big problem in New York. <coughs> In terms of water treatment plants, I, I hear that you have to talk on water treatment plants. There are two water treatment plants in the state that claim they might be able to handle this. It's probably not true. Uh, so really, there's not a good place. And 
In Pennsylvania, some of the water treatment plants tried to handle it, and they contaminated the Pittsburgh water supply by doing that. Okay, so we don't have a good solution with water treatment. Recycling. Recycling is being done in Pennsylvania. It's a pretty good idea. They're using less water, but they're concentrating the toxins that they have. And they're just making the stuff more toxic when they do dispose of it. Injection wells are interesting. Um, New York State actually has some history of this. In Avoca, New York, about almost, almost exactly 11 years ago, there was an earthquake due to an injection well, just like we've been hearing about happening in Ohio and in Arkansas. There was, it was like a 3.2 magnitude in New York. The ones in Ohio and Arkansas have been a, a, an order of magnitude larger. Okay. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, Michelle mentioned that spreading the wastewater on the roads has been defined as a beneficial use. I, you know, this is, uh, this is, I think, something that they got from George Orwell. I don't know. <laughs> How many of you read this? 1984. It's a little bit dated now because what, what was supposed to happen in 1984 didn't actually happen. But uh, the Ministry of Peace is what wages war, etc. Yeah. So it's it's sort of the double speak of, of uh, New York. But anyway, why can they spread this stuff on the roads? Well, the reason they can spread it on the roads is that the EPA has defined anything, any product that is a waste from the oil and gas industry as non-hazardous. It doesn't matter if you drink it and it'll kill you. <laughs> it's non-hazardous, okay? And I like to compare this to something, I mean, like Michelle will often tell me not to eat meat, okay? So what, what I can do is I can have a steak and define it as a vegetable and then eat it, right? That's what the EPA is doing. Now New York, is, the, the assembly, New York State Assembly has passed a law to rescind this, to say, okay, if something's toxic, then it's toxic, it's hazardous. But the Senate has blocked it. So I think they're gonna reintroduce, reintroduce it this year. We hope it passes. Okay. What else comes with this industry? Well. Increased truck traffic and, and crime. Uh, this is, this is a, these are signs that I really thought were interesting. We, we took these pictures in Pennsylvania outside of Tawanda. Tawanda has this uh, traffic problem. I don't know how many of you have driven through Tawanda. It sort of makes New York traffic, New York City traffic look sort of mild. I mean, it'll take, this is a town of about, used to be like 3,000 people. It could take two or three hours to get through the town. Okay. Now, I, I don't know what you might think about, uh, you know, freshmen coming into Hamilton College uh, and their parents coming in and they seeing signs <laughs> on the roads that say, high DUI crash area. Well, I hope this doesn't come here, and I hope it doesn't come here either. Uh, we've seen in Pennsylvania loss of tourism. It seems as though agriculture is suffering. Um, and to, it, it, tourism is interesting because you hear that tourism has gotten better in Pennsylvania because the hotel rates, occupancy rates, are up. <laughs> That's because the thrillers fill up the hotels with their, with their people. Housing values plummet, rents go up. The rents go up because there's so many migrant workers that are coming in and they need places to stay. Okay. So in terms of economics, there are some people that are going to win. Some people are going to get rich. But at least where we live, 95% of the people are going to lose. Okay. So, this is the way we look at it. Without rigorous scientific studies, the gas drilling boom sweeping the world. And let me just stop there when I say sweeping the world. I'm talking about, we've talked mainly about our little corner of the world. New York, Pennsylvania. We talked a little bit about Colorado, Texas, that sort of thing. But this isn't, we're not limited. We're actually exporting this to other countries. Canada and the United States are exporting this to other countries. This is happening in Canada. But not just there. Uh, it's happening in Europe, Ireland, UK. Uh, Ireland, UK, France has banned it. 
Uh, Germany's thinking about it. Poland's going, going whole hog into it. Bulgaria's banned it. Uh, South Africa, in the desert, where they have very little water, Shell wants to come in and do hydraulic fracturing with millions of gallons of water. Right now, they're smart enough to have a moratorium. Um, Australia is another country. So it's sweeping. It's an absolute worldwide phenomenon. So without rigorous scientific studies, the gas drilling boom sweeping the world will remain an uncontrolled health experiment on an enormous scale. And we are going to be the laboratory mice. Uh, open the floor to uh, comments and questions, please. Yeah, 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 I you to tell you after, so what was your question? Oh, my question was, when they, when they found these, the, the cattle that had died within hours after, uh, within an hour, within an hour yeah. were they, did they ingest this by drinking it, or was it just the fact that they plotted through it and it got into their skins? And, uh, that's a good question. I don't know that anybody really knows that for sure, but I would think that they uh, ingested it because they were foaming at the mouth, okay. and that they, and they regurgitated it, and then they so, uh, so we think that they actually drank it. It's Lapped pretty it salty yeah. stuff, so they, they go for it. Okay, all right, thank you. Awesome. Questions, please. Hi. Um, oh, how are you? I'm sorry, Mark. This is a classmate of mine from Cornell. <laughs> <laughs>
So when, they're dri when they drill a well, they just drill it, and this gas comes flying out of it, and, it gets, and sometimes they just let it go into the atmosphere, and sometimes they burn it until they put a cap on it and start collecting it. Okay? And then, even then, pipelines are leaking all the time. So you're leaking all this methane into the air. And the question is, how big of a problem is that? Uh, you know, there, there are different estimates that have gone back. The one group at Cornell says it's a very low percentage, the other one says it's a higher percentage. Well, recently, a study <coughs> came out in Colorado that said that it's even worse than anybody thought. Okay? So the emissions around, particularly around fracking operations, are enormous. So, basically, you know, I can't, I'm not really, I, I, I've given you sort of a summary of the arguments, I can't really say who's right in this, but it's, you know, two groups of people who look at different sets of data in different ways and make different arguments. If I had a guess, I would, I would sort of fall on the side of the people that are saying that the shale gas is going to cause us some problems. But I hope that answered you. Yeah. You had said at the very beginning that um, the cattle that died, they showed lesions internally right. and that they might have been caused by uh, particular compounds. Yeah. I should have written down because I can't remember the name of them. How difficult is it to test for those compounds? Um, it's pretty difficult. Those are not normal assays. Um, and a lot of these cases, we don't really know what happens to those chemicals in the bodies of animals. So those were quaternary ammonium compounds and um, are called quats. Uh, they're very toxic and they can kill in an hour. So when the pathologists and toxicologists were looking at that necropsy report and looking at the whole history of those of that herd, they were looking for something beyond the petroleum compounds that were found in the, in the small intestine. They knew that there had to be something else there uh, that most likely killed uh, that herd. Uh, but it is hard to, to test for these compounds sometimes, especially with, um, even in that case, they didn't reveal all the chemicals. They don't have to reveal all the chemicals. There were proprietary compounds there that were still not revealed. So we don't have the whole picture, but there were quaternary right, there were quaternary compounds that gave them somewhat of a lead. And I do have to say uh, that with that case in Louisiana, um, that did eventually, I believe, get gagged. That was the only case where I could not speak to the owners. They never returned phone calls. I spoke with a reporter down there in that case. She said she thought they were gagged. So. They might have actually found the chemicals in the, in the tissue, and the owners might have been paid off by the gas company. That's not something. I hit the wall. That's what we, uh, Robert was referring to earlier, was that uh, in these cases, when non-disclosures are signed, we hit the wall with finding out data. It's just everything's shut down. They cannot reveal what exactly happened to their health, their animal's health, or the settlement uh, that's made. So when you say they cannot reveal, they cannot reveal to a newspaper? They or can't, no, or they, or they are severely fined. They are, you know, what is, what is the uh, fines that they are, uh, a lot of money is written, the way these contracts are written, if they say anything to anybody, they will pay for their neighbor. Even their neighbor. Anybody, anybody. Right, anybody. right. But with what you presented us tonight, I mean, it seems, how do they dispute the evidence that you are presenting? I mean, it seems like we have those who are for higher fracking and those who are against. Well, so. what, you know, what they would say about this, and, and still, and I will say it too, is that if you put this in a court of law, there's, as long as, you know, if I gave an animal this chemical, unless I find it in, and they die, unless I find it for absolute sure in the animal, then that's somewhat of a proof. proof. That's somewhat of a proof that that's maybe that's what caused it. But in the case with the cows, as far as I know, the chemical was not actually found in them, in their tissue. It was it was found in the what they drank but was not found in the tissue. So this is actually an important point. There, there was a there's a bill, another bill that was introduced in the uh, state assembly that never made it past the Senate. Well, it, and, and it had to do with the burden of proof. And uh, and what it said was that the burden of proof would have to be on the drillers to show that they didn't contaminate the water. But that our Senate didn't pass that. <laughs> so what is it? What's, I know it's all about economics. I know. Last week I read a book in the newspaper that um, Pennsylvania.
Pennsylvania, CEC, tested water somewhere in Pennsylvania, and they found it being not contaminated. Oh, is this the EPA and DIMIC? EPA, yeah. yeah. Right, so it's a little bit that I know about that, and what else you know, is that it, it, the tests have not been fully completed yet. So they should not have done a press release that, that put that out there to give people the idea that now DIMIC is okay. Because we don't think DIMIC is okay, that people still can't drink their water. I don't know why they did that. Uh, I, I know this is outside of the limits of what you were studying, but maybe you know if there's other studies that are being done. You mentioned the, the possibility of contamination of the, the meat from these animals. Right. What about the contamination of other crops? Right, that's right. I mean, yeah. wheat or, or corn right. or food crops. Yep, you know? yep. And as far as I know, I mean, that's... Is uh, they that's I, I, that? No, I don't know if anybody's studying so that. either water or air. Yes, definitely. You know, most likely it's being going to be. I mean, yeah, I would assume that if a, a, you know, a spill ran across the field, that they would not harvest that themselves. to us. But you know, you know, right? You won't. But an right. optimistic assumption. Right? <laughs> but lower levels could be. Yeah. Well, but also in the cases that I uh, talk about in the paper, some of the cases there, the cattle are, are eating the grass, maybe where the water spilled, you know, and it starts getting to be like, well, you know, what's really going on with the grass? How much does it pull up from the soil? What's really in the soil? It's very complex. I spoke with some um, soil scientists at Cornell, and they told me that if what goes on in the chemistry in the soil, a lot of it's not really understood. And especially when you put this in the mix, a lot of chemicals we don't even know what's exactly in this. Uh, there's lots of interactions. So well, what do you mean isn't necessarily going to, to be safe? That's <laughs> right. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. I think your arms gonna get tired. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, question questions from Michelle. I may have already answered it just a moment ago, but uh, what you mentioned earlier that when someone asked you about food safety and your answer was you don't know, right. I, I was wondering in addition to what you said just a bit ago. Is it also because there's the lack of a large-scale study? Uh, because it seems to me with the stuff that you presented this evening, there's a lot of post anecdotal evidence that, that this is, this is right. problematic. Yeah, so yeah. So I mean, can you also say, well, there's anecdotal evidence that, the, that there's a problem that's insane? Right, no, yeah. So the whole idea with that, um, with that case, uh, that case number three, the one that was quarantined, that was a real eye-opener for me. Um, because I did not expect that answer. I expected when I called Ferret that they would say, oh sure, here's, uh, you know, here's what our, our, our data is based on. For all of these chemicals, we have the answers, you know, we know. Instead, he said, I have no idea. We'd love to have money to, to fund this, to research this out further, but we, we don't have the funding at all for it. What the government spends money for food safety for funding is uh, infectious diseases. So they're really concerned if cows have an infectious disease like brucellosis, uh, you name many infectious diseases, that's what they're concerned about more than chemical contaminants in the animals. They're much more concerned with uh, disease. But, but even with your studies, though, can you at least say, you know, maybe there is no large-scale systematic study, but, but from our investigations to this point, there's uh, a lot of data points from where, where we can say, yes, there, there is uh, right. Uh, yeah, I think so, for sure. But um, you know, what the way the, the way the government breaks it down is the USDA takes care of inspections for meat. FDA takes care of everything else. So this falls under USDA, and it's that National Institute of Food and Agriculture. I had that in there. So that's what Barrett is under too. And they would need money from them, from the government, to fund a, a study uh, for them to backtrack and say, okay, now we have the answers to these questions. And we can say exactly what's going on with this in the animals. Um, and just, and as, go ahead. Just one last follow-up. Then, then what would you recommend in terms of advocacy? You know, pressuring the government for USDA funding for these types of studies? You know, I've written so many letters, uh, and I don't get answers, don't get answers back, or they get back and they say, "Go to somebody else. Uh, go to somebody else." So. Um, what we did in our town, we, people always ask the same question. They say, what do you do? How can, how can I protect myself or my animals from this? And we have a ban in our town. Uh, we figured the federal government's not going to protect us. The state government is not going to protect us. 
How about our local government? What can what can we do? Um, and that's well, let me just say, I think one place where there might be useful pressure places in Hagen and Martins is to try to get them to do something. They're doing nothing now, but if, you, if, if they hear from enough people saying, you know, we need to have our, we need to know that our food supply is safe, you know, maybe they'll say, say oh, this is something we should consider. So let me just say to Mark and uh, the other veterinarian here, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Uh, there's a head veterinarian of New York State, a head of the, and I, and I forget his name, uh, but I wrote to him, I sent him my paper, I, I, you know, everything, no response uh, back. And someone actually spoke with him from Cornell, uh, or they actually spoke with him, and, and he said that, just what Robert said, he's going to leave it up to the DEC, because they're the ones in charge to determine if it's safe. And, and this is where it gets completely frustrating, because that's what Cuomo says too, well, I'm just going to leave it up to the DEC, they know best. You know, <laughs> Well, we might have to start uh, the state legislature under right. pressure from the state medical society did approve funding right. last week. Right. Uh, it, I think it said environmental, it didn't say food safety. There's a health in, health impact assessment. Right. right. So I don't know where the funding is going to be. Right. Directed. Yeah, we got we sort of got that started. We were in all. There is a gentleman here tonight that does uh, work for one of our state assembly people. Uh huh. Uh, John Stevens sitting over here works for works with Anthony Berlisi, so we do have some Fantastic. Great. Yeah, that was Barbara Lifton, I think, that got that started. She's in from our area, and we spoke with her in Albany. We were there a couple weeks, uh, or two or three weeks ago, uh, and we spoke with people about the importance of, of getting a study like that started. So it, it's, it's a good start. Uh, so maybe something will come of that if it doesn't get killed in the Senate. A lot of these things will pass in the Assembly, but then get killed in the Senate. Many of the pictures that you showed here were of food stock, cows, etc. What about wildlife? The, you know, small fish eating the next size fish eating the next size. The, the rabbit drinking this right. water eating by the fox, the fox eaten by the wildcat, by the bear, by the etc. Right. I mean, how do you how do you even begin to trace something like that? Or, and and, and it, I'm guessing most of the work would be done easier with controlled herds like dairy cows and beef cows, but that has to be, in terms of strictly of exposure, you're almost able to keep herd cows or herd uh, animals away from this. But wild animals are just by nature wild. They'll go where they're going to go. And if there's a large puddle of water before they stick their head in it, uh, you know, how do you, are you, is there an attempt to try and monitor those animals as well? Or as part two of that is, have you seen fox, deer, bear, well you did see them, Deer, but bear, wildcat, any of the wild predators have not ingested uh, a uh, animal that had been contaminated. Well, they, uh, there's one, actually the farm that was quarantined uh, is a large farm, over 500 acres. It's a beef cattle farm. Uh, they had hunters, they always have hunters, they allow hunters on their property. Mm -hmm. um, and right after drilling is that, uh, they they were drilled in forgetting how it was the fall. But it was soon after drilling and, and fracking was done on that well. Uh, the hunters were up there and they killed deer. And the woman said, you know, she told the guy, she said, you know, the deer were all around the impoundment, all around the drilling mud pit. I don't know, we better be careful. Uh, so they shot a few deer uh, and they, they ate them. Their, their animals refused to eat the meat. This is what they told the farmer. So they thought, wow, that's a little funny. The animals usually eat the meat, but they're going to eat it anyway because maybe that's something wrong with the animals. Uh, they ate the meat and they got very, very sick. This is on one, one of the deer that they killed. Very, a lot of vomiting and diarrhea. So then they thought, well, okay, they got another deer. It must have just been that deer. <laughs> so they um, had it. Deer 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 deer. Deer. Had another deer and they had a big party. So they must have invited a lot of friends and everybody got sick. So they gave uh, that farmer several steaks to have in her freezer in case somebody wanted to test. So she tried to give them to us to test. But what's happening now in Pennsylvania is the uh, state game commission is saying, no, we, don't, we cannot test that because it's not chain of custody. So when you do a test, legal oh, yeah. test, you have to have a chain of custody. So somebody could have come along and injected that meat with something. So what does the testing mean? So that's what we are with that. So that's the best I can answer that question. Uh, I, can, I can say a few other words. One of the things that some people, are, there's a, we just talked to someone last weekend who went to Wilkes University who's starting to study fish 
uh, in, in streams that have been contaminated. So that's sort of more, a little yeah. bit more direct, you know, yeah. the story. And there's someone at Cornell that started studying fish in a different way as well. And the, but the other thing you mentioned is kind of uh, interesting, and that is, you know, in, in Pennsylvania, and in New York, we have we have this beneficial use where, where they spread brine on our water. So far, they claim it's not drilling waste, but in, in Pennsylvania, it's, it's drilling waste. And, you know, they spread it all the time, not just when it's going to snow. They spread it when it's raining, they spread it when it's not raining, etc. But they, lots of times they have puddles on the roads, and, you know, you have, you know it's, uh, how hard is it to keep your dog from running in and drinking that nice salty yeah. water? And, uh, and Michelle talks to some people whose dogs have died. What are these farmers paid? It seems to be really quiet. The only time I heard money mentioned was on a PBS program where this lady was really excited. She got a signing bonus of $58,000. So there's a signing bonus. Right, there's a signing bonus. And then they get and they have royalty. Right, and it really differs. We can talk to people about how much they get. Because they don't want people to know what per, other people per, get. Right, per acre, right, they don't. And they, some people got one, one or two dollars an acre for a. Yeah, it's one one dollar to five thousand dollars an acre. That's what our. That's, that's what the range is. is. Well, what is one dollar to five or to five thousand is high. That's what we heard. Oh, okay. And so, per acre. Per acre. Yeah. Right. And so, so what happens is there, at least in New York, there are several different ways that this can happen. So you can. Most of what mo mostly you you sign a lease that says you'll start getting royalties after. They pay for everything, and of course they don't even tell you how much gas they take out. But at some point in the future, they decide what when to give you royalties. That's on the what they take out, because they, they think they need to recoup all of the everything they put into the first. But you have the option in New York. Uh, this sounds great. So you can pay for the entire well if you want to. No, <laughs> you know how many people can do that? And then and then you can get get more money back. <laughs> when they start pumping it out. Um, but that, I don't think too many people take that up. But, um, so, so I don't, you know, it's not clear, you know, how many people have made their money just on the signing and how many people have really gotten a lot of money from the It's kept really quiet. It is. And all the reading that I've done, it was just that one on one program that I heard money actually mentioned. Well, I will just tell you real quickly, I always ask these farmers, were they ever compensated by the drilling company? For these farmers that have lost cattle, the farmer that had to quarantine, they have pipelines across their fields, they have their pastures cut off, they have pastures ruined because of this wastewater and this ruining of the crops. No one has been compensated. No one. Now this is before a settlement, so I'm assuming that at a settlement they will be compensated, but then they're not, we don't know, because they don't have an disclosure agreement. Right, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. As far as, as for the wildlife, um, have you given any thought to partnering with your friends over at the lab uh, using Christmas bird count, Project Feeder Watch? That's a great backyard bird count. That's a fantastic um, Because, you know, yep. you've got several members of the local bird club sitting right here. Right. Uh, and we've done a Christmas bird count every year. How long has our circle been done? Uh, since the early 70s, I believe. Right. That's, that's, really that's a lot of data. Right. And, you know, when, when you talk about all the Christmas bird counts that are done, all the places that use Project Fear Watch or eBird, um, you know, that information could be invaluable as far as looking at population trends of particular birds right. over an extended period of time. Yeah. I mean, just in the relatively short time our circle's been done, you can see you know, various birds, unfortunately, mostly going like this, but you can see differences in the population, and, and that information, information might prove valuable. Absolutely. No, that's a great idea. That's a fantastic idea. We have people who we've documented who are some people are just doing wildlife, and they really, in their area, and watching the numbers change and seeing the dead wildlife and different species. Are you working with any um, with particular people in the Department of Natural Resources? No, no, I'm not. That's all that's a fantastic. Paul Charlie Smith and well, Helen Karen. What I what I <laughs> you love it. What I, what I usually find though is the same thing we found by calling the veterinarian there in Albany is that they do not want to take a stand on this. People yeah. are really politicized this issue. It's unfortunate. 
they'll say, the D, that's the DEC, I'm not going to get involved, I'm not going to take an opinion mm -hmm. on this. But this is our health, this is our animal's health, this is our food. We've got to take an opinion, you've got to have a stand. And they're, they're refusing to take a stand. So sort of tending to stay away from, unfortunately. You know, people that haven't gotten any response from that. But it's a great idea about the bird count. You think they're just sitting back waiting for the House of Cards to tumble and I, let the DEC take yeah, the meeting? Yeah, I have no idea. Their the heads are in the sand. And then they can say, they see, I told you so? <laughs> so you know, as, a, yeah. as an afterthought? <laughs> it's unfortunate. Yes, um, over time, have you been seeing an increase in concern and involvement in the veterinary and medical communities around this issue? Um, the veterinary, I haven't too much. Uh, I've talked to veterinarians all over the country involved with these cases, and some people are starting to become aware of the issues, um, but there are very few who are, are, are knowledgeable about you know, what's really happening. Yeah, I mean, at, I can say at College of Veterinary Medicine, it seems that over the last few years, people have gotten more, more interested in it. I've seen you know, people who um, I, Never thought about it before. All of a sudden, start having problems. These are veterinarians. Uh, the medical society in New York seems there are quite a few people that are, are active in questioning, you know, the health impacts. Uh, there have been a number of letters written by a whole bunch of doctors to the whole legislature. This is in contrast to Pennsylvania, where <laughs> it's sort of seems to be the opposite where they seem to try to put it out of health effects. Really, you're not aware that physicians are um, pushing back against this if it's new a new law, saying that they Yeah, there there was yeah, right. There, there we talked to some someone on Saturday who was um, who was working with a law office and was trying to recruit um, Physicians that felt felt they could recruit enough physicians, they could start pushing, you know, bring a lawsuit about about the, that the new law. Yes. Is the opposition to the pipeline in the middle of the country, the, the shale, the gas shale pipeline, coming from Canada? I believe. Are you aware? Of you the are you talking about Yeah, he's Is that tar sands? That's tar sands. It's not. That's that's not no, that that's tar. That's that's the tar sands of Alberta. That's the, you know, we we worry about fracking. We worry about what's going to happen to you know our area with fracking. The part of the, the tar sands in Alberta, they've taken a beautiful area, and I think the moon at this point is more habitable than than the tar sands. So they've basically destroyed completely destroyed the environment. That's probably the, the worst insult that man has ever had on this planet. So the thought that we are bringing that dirty stuff all the way through our country to ship it off to China is disgusting. Sorry. <laughs> Right. 
Yep. So, you know, it's a cost benefit thing, and it seems that maybe it's not even good for the dairy farmers. Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, the, the data on the number of farms that have actually gone out in Pennsylvania is not out yet, and it won't be out until 2014. They take census every five years. So it was 2002, 2007. It'll be done this year, but it won't be available until for two years. At that point, we will have a number of uh, beef uh, farms, dairy farms, and we'll be able to look in Pennsylvania what has happened over that time. That Penn State study that I was referring to earlier where I said the number of uh, dairy cows and the milk production dropped in the counties that had the most drilling compared to the counties that didn't. Um, what the, the take that the Penn State researchers uh, put on that at the end, little spin, was that, um, well, the farmers could be um, dropping their dairy cow numbers and putting money into their equipment on the farm. Um, they could be improving their farm. So, you know, if that's true, then we will see that in the census data for 2012. We will not see those farms drop. My gut feeling is that we are going to see the farms drop because I don't know how these people can stay in business. I, we've been on several farms and we, they told us what it looked like before. They have no compensation. Their animals are sick. They're sick. Nobody would want to stay there. Uh, I don't know who's going to buy that land. We're told sometimes the drillers buy the land at a you know, really cut price because nobody else wants it. So um, and the, I'm going to be really interested in 2014 to see what those numbers in Pennsylvania say, what the number of farms. So that's the best answer I could give you. But the, the point you make at me is, you know, that's, that's such an important thing. I mean, people, people who are suffering, you know, grab at, at you know, these leases as a way of trying to stay solvent. And, you know, it's kind of hard to argue, you know, if this is your only way of surviving, of course. But, you know, for people that don't, the problem, the problem that you come down to is that right now, you know, you're not going to get any money in royalties, basically, because the price of gas is so low that it's going to take, the, and they, they can't produce enough gas for most of the wells to pay for them. Uh, so at this time, you're making a deal, but you're making a losing deal, even if you think you're trying to pull yourself out of debt. Yeah. It may be different in 10 years' time. So what can we do? <laughs> <laughs> there we, we have this information. I, I have a little answer to that. There's some exciting legislation now coming, not mainly from where it's coming from, not so much the content. The time has been good. It's uh, proposing a five-year moratorium, statewide moratorium, in combination with a system, a system-wide study in SUNY from the four SUNY centers on the cumulative effects of hydrofracking. <coughs> so that, that's good, I mean, we love the band, but this is a step, a big step in the right direction, a five-year uh, moratorium. But the interesting part is where it's coming from, it's from uh, uh, Senate Republican. So we know we've had some resistance, a lot of resistance in the Senate, so here's Greg, Greg, Greg Paul. Paul. Greg Paul. Yeah. Um, Ken Levat. Oh, oh, oh okay. fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Greg so, Paul's been the um, charge. Please hop on that, and uh, you know, it looks like it might get hung up in the State and environmental committee, and that you know, this is where I think you got to start paying more attention to these people who bottleneck like these things, and you know, see if we can get them out of there. <laughs> but, that's um, right. But anyway, that's uh, it's uh, S6703. Uh, <laughs> so, if you want to take a look at it, there's a state senate website. S6703. Thank you. Fantastic. On the back table, by the way, there's a, there's a, a <laughs> host of information. There's three separate sheets with individuals named uh, our elected officials locally, uh, our, uh, our state uh, folks, and uh, there's a particular uh, uh, list that has 13 different uh, state senators that are on the environmental committee. Uh, some are, some are uh, definitely uh, in opposition to, it would be in opposition to us this evening, but there are some there, the, uh, the chairman of that is a, seems to see things uh, in a clear light. Uh, but there, there's 13 of them there. Uh, we've suggested amongst ourselves in different areas that uh, you take the opportunity to jot these folks a, a letter uh, explaining your position and uh, reminding them that uh, election time is always around the corner for these folks. <laughs> and it's important to, for them to know that not only do we oppose their actions, uh, we also have control over their future. Uh, voting is still the way 
these folks get in, uh, get in their position, and it's still the way they get out. So, uh, you know, being politically active, uh, and, and all the time that we've done this, and we've been a group here on and off for over a year, a year and a half, I've always said we want to try and keep the politics out of this topic because it's above politics. You shouldn't put a Republican prefix or a Democrat pre, uh, prefix in front of it. But it's becoming painfully obvious to me that you have to get involved with this at a different level. Just because you're right doesn't make it. You have to be able to levy some type of pressure on the people that are going to sit back and make these decisions. And the only pressure that they understand is a voting block. <coughs> so I would ask that everybody take some of those names that are on that back table, if you haven't gotten them already, jot them a line, tell them that you're either pleased or you're displeased with their voting record, and we're watching. And there's more of us than there are of them. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, I certainly include Governor Cuomo. Most of us probably already have been in touch with the governor's office more than once, but I would continue that action and spread it out and request to your family or friends who are like-minded, because I think he would, ultimately, he will be able to pressure sure. as well when it comes to his ass, and he needs to know exactly how we feel. And I also would like to say that Gary mentioned the, the newspaper, the blowback, the blowback. Um, I, there are many um, copies here. I have some bundles, thank you. I have some bundles um, that I got from Bonnie Reynolds today. And um, if anybody has a group or a a place where they think they would like to leave some, where people would pick them up, I would be happy to give you some. We would be delighted. Okay. Thanks. Any more questions? Can I say one more thing? But Certainly. Yeah. But, you know, I think one of the points you made was really important, was that this isn't really about politics. And uh, we did, in our little town of Ulysses, we we did a little bit, a little survey, and we got names, and. Uh, and we correlated that to voting records. So we, so we got their names, we knew whether they're Democrats or Republicans, how old they were, you know, sort of what part of the town they lived in, that sort of thing. There's absolutely no correlation with age, um, sex, or politics. You know, the same percentage of people who were against this were Democrats or Republicans. There's, it doesn't correlate with politics. That we didn't know. That's a good, that's a really good question. It's pretty high because of the yeah. yeah, it might be a little skewed in there. Yeah, yeah. You know, I just wonder, you know, over a, a large area. That would be um, interesting. Yeah, that's we were just doing it with death and voting records, so that wasn't yeah. all. So, but anyway, <laughs> but I, I think it's important to point out that, you know, it's not a Republican Democrat issue. It's, you know, we're all in this. We, 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 we should allow the Republicans to miss this hard I, I don't know. Okay. I Any other questions? Somebody comes. Yes. Next month we will have another speaker that will kind of follow this. Uh, you're talking about the farmers and their they're wanting to uh, get music just because they have to make ends meet. Our speaker will be Greg May, who is a uh, a banker from Captions Town, who yes. just got on the Sabatier, and he will have information about just what happens when you sign a lease. I encourage everybody to come to that. He's a, he, he's a really interesting speaker. Okay. With that, I thank you for your time this evening.